I'd like to start with a story of other people's suffering. Uh, let's take us back to 2014. And a woman named Brisha Borden, who is a young African-American woman, was late to pick up her godson from school. So she was walking down the street with her friend, and she noticed that there was two stray uh, items, a small bicycle and a scooter. So because they were late, they decided to just sort of swipe these two items so that they could go and pick up their godson on time. One can imagine, if, since this person was also quite poor, the potential social ramifications of not picking up the kid from time on school. There's all sorts of pressure to fall into gang activity and fall prey to some of the other, you know, the other temptations that might exist in a neighborhood like this. So she was caught and uh, brought into a juvenile detention center and uh, eventually released, but this infraction was on her record. Uh, fast forward, actually, it reversed back a year before, where a man named Vernon Prater walked into a convenience store armed and stole, oh, one thing I forgot to mention, the total value of goods for the, uh, the Huffy bicycle and the small scooter was less than $80 US. Okay, year before, Vernon Prater walks into a convenience store, he's armed, he steals, I think it was $83.67 worth of material. Uh, Prater had a criminal record in his past. He'd been caught for armed robbery on multiple occasions. Um, and both of these individuals, he had also ended up incarcerated that evening. So both of these individuals, the risk of their potential uh, likelihood for future convictions was assessed using a tool called Compass, which was written about by ProPublica in a couple years back now. It's actually quite well known in the fairness community. Um, Brisha, our first uh, subject of the story, when, uh, you, when, the, when the tool was used to assess her risk, she came up as an eight, and Vernon, with his background and the armed robbery, came up as a three. And if we look at some of the data that went into uh, informing these scores, Brisha had had four prior juvenile misdemeanors, and after this infraction and after this tool was used to predict the risk of her future, you know, future convictions, she had zero subsequent offenses. Vernon, on the other hand, had had two armed robberies, one attempted armed robbery, and his subsequent offense was one grand theft. So we say to ourselves, why did this happen, right? How did this woman with her relatively minor juvenile misdemeanors be classified as having such a higher risk score than Vernon, who had prior relatively grave offenses. Um, when one looks across the statistics across the entire population as spread out for the one attribute of these two individuals, uh, Brisha being an African-American black woman and Vernon being a white dude, uh, one sees that the risk scores stay relatively high systematically across the, back, the black population and fall precipitously for the white population. So there's instances of bias in the algorithm. It, it systematically is tending to undervalue the potential risk of white defendants and overvalue those of black across the population. So our question is, why is this happening? I mean, that's what this talk is about today. Is it because algorithms are evil? So we are uh, abdicating our agency to a set of tools that are going to increasingly become intelligent and take over the human race and do bad stuff that we don't like. For my jocular tone, you can probably imagine that I will not argue for this position. Um, is our conclusion that algorithm judgment is fundamentally different in kind than human judgment? So are these algorithms, because they're processing data and statistics at scale, rendering judgments that are quite different from the type of mental procedures that, and I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in criminal law, but if anybody in here is, that a judge is expected to apply when assessing the individual merits of a case at hand. I find that that's a potentially interesting avenue of exploration, but often not all that impactful for thinking about how to use systems ethically and accountably. So what I'd like to propose is that algorithms are convex mirrors that refract our own biases. Um, Somebody asked me once, I think, why, oh, why I chose convex versus concave, and the answer was that I really like this image, which is from um, a 16th century uh, painter, Parmagi Parmagianino, uh, who there's a great poet named John Ashbery who wrote a fantastic poet about self-representation based upon this image later on. So um, there's nothing that has to do with the, the way in which machine learning functions cave that informs this direction. It's just based upon the fact that I really like this image. But the key thing is that there's actions in society 
that end up trickling in and creeping into these algorithms in ways that we need to be mindful of as we're starting to use these systems to automate decisions or inform decisions in practice. So throughout the rest of the talk, I'm going to go through and explain, for those of you who don't come from a computer science or machine learning background, basically the basic intuitions behind what machine learning is. I'll explain areas in a machine learning system development process where bias can creep in, and then talk about what we can do about it, both from a legal and regulatory perspective, policy perspective, and also from a technical perspective. Okay, so supervised learning 101, what is this? So um, in my last company, Fast Forward Labs, my colleague Hillary Mason developed what we called the Maslow's hierarchy of data science capabilities. So there's a lot of terms out there that you'll hear often interchanged, even though they might ne necessarily not always need to be interchanged in this field. Um, starting with the bottom layer, which we, which is often known as big data. So big data has been overused in the past and seems to be synonymous with any and all awesome insight capability from data. But in the technical community, it's a, it's a basic layer on the bottom to collect, process, and store data. So once we have data, we can do stuff with it, right? We can process it. So the sort of first layer of things that we can do with it is we can count things uh, that occurred in the past. So analytics is the practice of performing relatively basic operations, counting, multiplying, subtracting, dividing, um, so as to gain some basic insights into things that have happened in the past so as to inform qualitative decisions about what one might do in the future. When you push into data science, the scale of these operations can become a little bit more complex. So as opposed to just adding and subtracting, we can define functions that do a good job mapping relationships in this data so as to not inform qualitative decisions but inform quantitative actions, automated actions sometime in the future. So a basic example would be uh, linear regression. So you've got a bunch of data points, we'll talk about this in the future, and you, you map a line that does a decent job capturing the sort of distribution of that data. And once you have that, when you put in a new point, you can say, okay, what's the corresponding output when I put in an X? Like, which, which Y do I get here, okay? Um, when we move into machine learning, the slope of that line can change. So as we get feedback, if we get new data points, or as the system engages out in the world, we can update the slope of our curve so it doesn't drop mapping it. And it can go not only from this basic linear function, but it can twist and turn and go all over the place from our measly three-dimensional appreciation of the world, four dimensions if we count time as humans, to like 500 dimensions. And the only people out there who can actually keep a mental model of sort of how these functions work are people like Jeffrey Hinton, who, whose mind just sort of works on a different plane than everybody else. Um, so processing, counting, making functions, functions with feedback loops that update over time, and then AI is sort of a marketing term that I like to consider whatever computers can't do until they can. So it's a, it's a psychological term that encompasses a wide range of underlying techniques, machine learning being the most popular today. That wasn't always the case. Um, I like thinking about it baking this notion of progress into the definition. Uh, to help think through the fact that there's not a rigorous techni technical definition of products that, quanti that qualify as machine learning products and products that don't. So Google Maps, um, for me, is a great example of a product that we don't, in our common day-to-day -day lives, think about as a machine learning product or AI today, but it's built on a massive amount of data and really sophisticated machine learning algorithms. Um, contrast that with self-driving cars, which feel like they're just barely possible and they're very AI-y based upon the type of capabilities that map to our own human capabilities. And like telepathy and brain-machine interfaces and all of that Elon Musk stuff is like sort of on the border of science fiction, right? So as opposed to it's being a rigorous technical definition, there's some even like a discrepancy in definitions in the machine learning community. It's much more how our perception of what qualifies as uniquely human engages with these technical capabilities. So as we shift into other things that have changed and what's interesting from an ethical perspective, what's been really um, meaningful for me as I parse this out is to think that for a long time, sociologists have been doing statistical analysis of patterns of bias in society. So you'll see these normal, what, the, what technical people call Gaussian distributions that will show that there might be you know, systemic prejudice against certain subpopulations, whatever that may be, and we're comfortable with this. This has existed for a while. It has not existed when placed into a product context where these distributions and analysis suddenly get packaged as decisions. Should I do this or should I do that? 
and decisions that then have feedback loops that go back to modify those distributions. So that shift from passive analysis to embedded, often not seen, uh, let's see, like the stimulus for action is, I think, the fundamental, um, let's say, axis of, of what's going on in the bias community today. So if we parse out what different types of machine learning capabilities, often when we read about it in the media, we think that machine learning is synonymous for super smart machines that can find patterns in data. Um, often without human supervision. So they're smarter than us. They can see the nuances of patterns that we with our measly three-dimensional perception and cognitive biases can't see. Um, if one sort of reads that, takes that seriously, it sounds like a field of machine learning called unsupervised learning, which is where basically we start off with a data set and the machine will go through and indeed identify and cluster different types of data into different categories based upon some sort of categorical or pattern-like similarity. The truth is most machine learning, this, this is a um, still active area of research. It's often used to explore trends in data before building a product, but rarely is the final the technique that's used in the in-production system. So I think the stats are like 90% of production machine learning systems use a different type of learning called supervised learning. This is a chart that Andrew Ng included in his HBR article where he basically describes it as we start out with an input, we get some response, and it turns into an application. I like to think about supervised learning in terms of proxies. So for me, I think about it as a problem where we want to say something about the world that's hard to know. Let's call that C. And because it's hard to know or hard to measure, we find a suitable proxy that's easy to measure and use that as a proxy to say something about this hard to know thing. We then find a function, a mathematical representation, that defines a correlation between the easy to know thing and the hard to know thing. And we use this function to make guesses about the hard to know thing. A couple of examples. So basic one, I just moved to Toronto in May from, I was first in the Bay Area and then in New York City. And um, I came here and everybody was like, real estate's really expensive in Toronto these days. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I feel like I live my, like, my relative well-being and ratio from income to expenses is like, it's like fantastic here. <laughs> so, um, so everything is contextual and relative, which is a sub point of this talk. Uh, but uh, let's describe a sort of a ba basic regression problem. So say our task is, here we are living in Toronto, we're about to buy a house, we're going to put ours on the market, and we want to know how much we should sell it for. Could be, you know, if, you're, if you've got access to market data, it could be an easy to know thing for most of us out there, it's a hard to know thing. What's an easy to know thing is the size of our house. So we can go to Canadian Tire and we can buy a tape measure and we can extend it out and we can measure the dimensions of our apartment. So then we can go through and we can say, all right, so what matters for the cost of our house? Is it the size? Is it its neighborhood? Is it it has amenities? Whatever those things might be. And we find that indeed it is the size that matters. So we go through and we look around and we ask our neighbors, we call some folks, and we just basically plot the size to the price of multiple houses. Get that up there. And then we define a function that does a good job mapping these data points. And then we input our footage, which we can measure easily, and use that, that's going to be on the x-axis, and use that to output the price we should put it on the market for. The learning part comes in, as I mentioned earlier on, where the slope is going to change over time. That's, that actually is machine learning, right? So people are like, it sounds like it's this fancy thing that no one can understand, but this instance of a regression is, uh, is a simplified form of machine learning. So sometimes our data does not fall into that nice continuous line. It falls into clumps. And we move from a regression problem to a classification problem. So here, the task, we want to know if incoming email is spam or not spam, hard to measure. We say it's very easy for us to, to do a search to see if Nigerian prints has showed up in our email. So we say, all right, that's going to be our feature that predicts whether or not it's spam or not spam. So you can imagine our classification, if we're only using Nigerian print, is going to be a little, it's going to be a little faulty. We're going to have a lot of false positives in our, in our classification tasks. So we can continue to add on more and more features, like spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, some sort of metadata, and list that out and turn it into a mathematical representation. We call it a vector embedding that just gets more complex over time. And this line that separates the good from the bad, you know, the positives from the negatives, will, be, will do an increasingly good job, an increasingly accurate job, classifying those two clumps. So then we say, well, what if our P is super complex? 
So the task at hand is to classify the cats and the dogs in a set of images. And we say, I don't know, is it the, is it the eyes? Is it the shape of the ears? Is it the texture of the fur? Right, so what P should we pick to do a good job being our proxy variable for the task at hand? And when it gets this hard, it's a good motivation to use some of the more complex tools that have fallen under the nomenclature of deep learning in recent literature, where we start off with our input data and then we use basically layers of computation set up as nodes in a network that are connected to one another with weights that can distribute signal with various degrees of probability. We basically spread out all of the knowledge compacted in what qualifies as a good relationship between P and C across this network. Um, and shift the work that we as machine learning technicians do from figuring out which features are going to be highly correlated to our output task and allow the network to sort of do that on itself. So a machine learning engineer here would select how many nodes in a network, um, the architecture of, of the solution so as to best map to the data. The corollary is that we often, because this knowledge has been distributed across all of these nodes and weights, don't really know why the system gave a particular output. It's not as readily cognizable by our measly simplifying brains. All right, so where does bias creep in? So first sort of rule of thumb is that if we think about the way in which we went about identifying the relationship between proxy characteristic and thing we want to know, um, if we are in the realm of certain classical methods, and I, and I say some because I don't want to reduce it down to all linear functions are have this characteristic and all deep learning functions don't have this characteristic. That's not accurate. But um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a crass basis for comparison, the following thing does hold. So often when one thinks about bias and explainability in machine learning, a lot of the focus has been on these deep learning systems because they have lower explainability in the model. The flip side is, because the data scientists and humans don't come in and do a lot of that selection process in their minds when they're deciding which features are going to be relevant, there's lower unconscious bias in the feature selection that could lead to performance in the model. Opposite balance holds for other types of techniques. right? So in the first one where we did the example of predicting the real estate price, there was a lot of human work and mental work that went into deciding that it was indeed my measuring, measuring tape from Canadian Tire that would be the thing I want to focus on to get the best performance. The model seems to be more explainable, so we can have a, it's, it's easier for us to locally ascribe a causation to input feature and output prediction, but that doesn't mean that bias is removed from the process. So when we build a data product, in addition to this, there's a hell of a lot more things that we do than just build a machine learning model. Um, I'll walk you through this and then for the, in this section, I'm going to walk through not every step, but various steps to show where bias can creep in. So effectively, we start off by generating data, right? We have various tools out there that capture data in particular ways. It could be sensors, if you've got like your Fitbit on and it's sort of tracking all sorts of biometric data. It could be that we're, we're using Facebook and we're importing likes. So the design of the tools that generate the data in the first place are instances where bias can creep in. We collect it. Um, sometimes we collect data about some populations, not others, based upon use of our systems. Uh, there's people in companies who then say, what do we want to know? What is our business need? What problems are we solving? What decision do we want to automate? So there's a whole structure of designing the problem. We then go and, we, and based upon the hypothesis we made of the problem we want to solve, we look through the data and we start to get a sense of whether or not we can design a quantified experiment that can help us answer that question. We process it, we do that feature engineering, we sort of render it from the basis stuff to a higher level of abstraction that can be useful for our models. We might regularize it and normalize it for the problem. And then we start to use models, right? And normally we start on a, on a small subsample of the data and we say, will this work in the first place or are we wasting our time completely? If we figure out it can work, we say, all right, let's scale this and push it out to um, larger data sets, new data sets in the future in production. We make questions on how frequently we want to update it, how we want to decide if we should shift models, if their performance changes in the future. And then we also have an interface either with the human who's going to sort of consume the output of these systems or uh, a business user, let's say, who gets to decide whether or not it's doing what it's supposed to do and it's worth their time and money. There's other things as well, but this is like the basic, I'd say the basic set of steps that occur. Okay, so 
data collection. So one issue in thinking about bias in machine learning systems comes from the samples of populations that are represented in the data set. So example here comes from this relatively new book, Automating Equality by Virginia Eubanks, who, who did an analysis of a system that was used to identify children who um, may be uh, subject to abuse in their homes. And what she found upon analysis was that often it was poor families, as with the results that we saw with the um, ProPublica risk assessment tool, where African Americans had uh, statistically higher risk scores than Caucasians. Here it was that children from poor, poor families tended to receive disparate treatment in contrast to children from rich families. And when she went through and looked through the analysis, um, it was seen that this Allegheny family screening tool, which was used by, I can't remember exactly the bureaucratic, um, the bureaucratic institution that was using it, they had tons of data on people who participated in public health programs. Uh, US health system, very privatized, a little bit different than here in Canada, and very little data on people who use private programs, which means the system, most of the time, tended to be biased towards the, 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 the subparts of the population from which data had been collected. So this is an artifact of the contextual situation of the use of public health programs in the area that led to skewed results on the system. Um, next thing, a little bit of a comment on proxies. So this is something that, going back to the, uh, the need to find a simple proxy to say something about something that's hard to know, this occurs in so many instances in the utilization of analytics and machine learning companies. So in my company, Integrate AI, where we work, we're really focused on lifetime value for customers. So we want to be able to, uh, say in the example of Facebook, um, optimize for daily active use. So we want users to come on and sign in at least once a day. Super hard to optimize for. So there was a group of um, product folks at Facebook who found that there was an overlap and correlation between people who got to 10 friends within 14 days and people who ended up being daily active users. So basically, when they were deciding to define their optimization products and programs, they were like, too hard to go for that hard to measure thing, pretty easy to measure and count if somebody got to 10 friends within 14 days, focus on that and like hammer all of your efforts in that direction. Airbnb found something similar. There's a tight correlation between stickiness and use on the site and putting up photos of your apartment. You can imagine if you like go on Airbnb and there's nothing to look at, you're probably not going to select that person's home. Um, and a lot of these consumer internet businesses use similar techniques to find something early on in the life cycle that's highly predictive of long in a life cycle. So these proxy metrics, when we get into socially sensitive situations, can be um, perilous and tricky to deal with. So back to the Allegheny family screening tool, the uh, problem that they wanted to optimize for with the system was identifying children who had been in some you know, situation of abuse in the home that then were harmed in some way. They, didn't, they couldn't observe the actual instances of harm, and they said here that it was sort of neglect-related fatalities. That number was quite low. So the proxy metrics that they used were instances of re-referral, so where they'd made a call with the system out to some family, and then a couple of weeks later, within some constrained time frame, somebody called back, they could count that. And they also could use foster care, so where a judge had made a decision that a child should be removed from a family as the target variable, right? The, the outcome that they wanted to assess that could be um, aff affiliated with uh, a long-term negative consequence of an instance of abuse. So what uh, Eubanks pointed out is that in terms of you know, where bias can creep into the system, this choice of proxy variable uh, brings with it a set of social biases. So basically, re-referrals depended upon people in the community deciding to call back in. Foster care depend upon decisions made by a court. So it's it's false for us to assume that these are somehow objectively truthful metrics that are correlated with the outcome that they're looking for. They're dependent upon uh, community decisions. Similarly, the, this is a great analysis by uh, Jonathan Zuer, who wrote a fantastic Medium post called Asking the Right Questions About AI, um, where he astutely points out that in this compass system, the question that we think we're asking of the tool is, what's the probability that Brisha Borden will commit a serious crime in the future as a function of the sentence you give them today? That's what this is designed to ask. 
Um, but as the data is analyzed, what it's actually asking is who's more likely to be convicted based upon past data. So since, going back to that distinction that I drew between sociological analysis and turning it into a, and turning it into a product, this is very much a sociological analysis passive question, right? How many, how many blacks and how many whites have been convicted over a given period of time? We can put that into a distribution. When this distribution gets packaged as a product, it opens up our ability to ask the wrong question of the data. I really like how Junger, how Zunger um, capsulized this and says, there's often a difference between the quantity you want to measure and the one you can measure. When these differ, your model will become good at predicting the quantity you measured, not the quantity for which it was meant to be a proxy. Last comment on design. So um, this is a slightly different point, and it has to do with the multiple sub-problems that can exist within an ML context. Uh, to integrate, and the task that we had was to help them optimize outreach to individuals who had the highest risk-adjusted return. So what that means is they they want to make you know they want to find customers who um, can be pre-approved for credit cards and who then are going to spend a lot of money with the bank because they want to make the most money possible from their customers. So they have to say as a marketing team, who should we reach out to when? We want to find people who can be pre-approved, people we have to do their expected risk of their default. We have to go on that and say, not only, like, will they pay their credit card, but how much return will they give to the bank? So will they use their credit card a lot? And then we have to say, of this set, who's the most likely to receive an offer that we, you know, that we give today? So everything except this is slightly different from the notion of proxies, but it shows that one task actually has within it multiple sub-optimization tasks. And the, there was a Gantt chart that I saw of um, pro procedures to even determine this, and it's like, it's mind-boggling how many steps there are in the process. Okay, so data processing. So shifting from what question are we actually, actually asking to how do we work with the data and what biases might exist in our data set before we move into our models? <clears throat> so um, this data set comes from Kinetics, which is an insurance aggregator here in Canada. It's a bit like uh, Expedia for insurance products if you haven't used it yet. I'd recommend you do because I've seen the, the distinction between a quote that, you, that one might get from the various insurance providers is like mind boggling. At least for um, at least for the input data that was given for an example, like a toy test that we did with this, we're working on a fair version of a model that we built for them with some folks at the Vector Institute right now. And we went through and just found discrepancy in price, and it was like six thousand dollars for a policy versus like two thousand dollars for the same policy. It was insane. Um, and you know, our task is to figure out if there is if this is in any way correlated with sensitive protective features like gender and marital status. So those are all within this set. Uh, when we first got this, a data scientist on our team had to go through and figure out how to represent this data so that it could best achieve our task, which was to um, optimize to whom they should send promotions so as to get people to buy an insurance policy. And in doing so, uh, our data scientists spoke a lot with subject matter experts at Kinetics who are humans who come with opinions and biases, as mentioned with the feature selection. So then we say, okay, so what do we do with this data to ensure that our predictions achieve the, the goal that we want them to achieve, but are hopefully as influenced as little as possible from the sensitive data in the set? So the first thing we can say is, let's just remove all of the rows and columns that have features that we don't want in our model. So let's just take gender out. You know, let's take income level out, marital status out, whatever we'd like. Uh, which is sort of a naive approach to it. I put this picture up because it has worked, this approach to blind fairness has worked quite well in other um, disparate impact settings. So this was a, um, from, I think it was in the 1970s where symphony orchestras had extraordinarily few female uh, concert mistresses and like principal violinists. So they just started to put a curtain in front of the, the auditioner and the you know the person who was who was making the judgment call and it like immediately boosted uh, the number of female uh, principal violinists. So we said, can we can we do the same thing with data science? And the answer is that it's tricky. Um, and it's tricky because often going back to these these the pitfalls of proxies, often a certain feature will end up being sort of an implicit proxy for another. So this, uh, a classic example is uh, one's postal code and location. So this is a map of Chicago 
the pink and magenta areas are where whites live, and the blue areas are where blacks live. Um, what's interesting about this map is that it uh, actually emerged from uh, from basically the, the intrinsic behaviors of different communities in the city. So it wasn't like legislated top down that the whites are in the north and the blacks are in the south. It was a, a you know a, an emergent property of the way in which these communities engage with one another that led to this. But the moral of the story here is if we remove race from the equation, ethnicity from the equation, um, uh, and we do and we retain postal code or zip code since this is from the U.S., we basically have encoded the same thing. So it's not going to work all that well. I'll talk more about techniques to try to decorrelate uh, a little bit later in the talk. Another example in data processing is labeling our training set. So where we come in and humans tell the computer that you know a puppy is indeed a puppy and a cat is indeed a cat. Um, there's instances where this is benign or where the mistakes are funny. So this is an example of a system we built at my last company, Fast Forward Labs. My colleague Hillary took a lot of pictures of New York City subway system. And here it says Gates, but it also used to classify it as correctional institutions, which uh, tells you a lot about what it's like to live in New York City, right? When you, it's like worse than the TTC when you're going to work in the morning. Um, so plenty of instances where uh, classification is benign. We all agree that a cat is a cat. Um, some of us uh, you know, have studied, uh, I don't even know what the word is, like cat catology, so can can sort of recognize species with greater detail than I can. I can only basically say cat and dog. I'm horrible with different breeds. Um, so those, you know, even if there are mistakes there, it's it's for most of us, it, it, it doesn't have a lot of social consequences. There are instances where it does. So um, this is an example of a system that was used to predict whether or not somebody would be a criminal based upon their physiognomy. So you put in the picture and it's like, it goes, it's taking the Brisha Borden and Vernon Prater to like the nth degree where it's like, you're born with these features and you're likely <laughs> to be a criminal. Um, legit. Uh, so uh, a couple of friends of mine who work at Google went through and said, this is bollocks. Uh, uh, eugenics has been debunked as pseudoscience for multiple reasons over the 20th century. Um, and what we're actually encoding here are, are is the bias from judges who had you know made uh, decisions as to whether or not category one is criminal and category two is not in, in past judicial proceedings. Um, as they say, the laundering of human prejudice through computer algorithms can make these biases appear to be justified objectively. So the language that the technical community will use to determine what we call ground truth, so the accurate, the, what, what, how, the, how the image should be classified a given to according to a given classification task, um, can cloud our own judgments if we don't ask the critical questions as, as to whether or not we're actually laundering prejudice. A similar example came from, actually the person who built this system is the founder of um, Cambridge Analytica, which was in the news this weekend, um, for other uh, practices that are actually, as somebody who's been familiar with Cambridge Analytica for a while, quite complex. Uh, the whistleblowing is, um, is it, it's just confusing to parse out exactly what happened versus what the media is reporting. So I do like Zainab Tufekhi's take, though, that this is not a data breach, it's a business model. Um, so I, I, think that's, I think that's accurate. Um, but at any rate, uh, <laughs> that dude um, also decided to say that uh, deep learning systems can predict uh, gaydar, or are better at gaydar than humans are, based upon intrinsic characteristics of people's physiognomy. Um, and Blaze and uh, Margaret went through and positioned themselves in you know, a series of photos where they looked more heteronormative and heterosexual, and a series of photos where they looked more homosexual to show that, yes, indeed, the system was picking up on some sort of characteristics and traits in the photo, but they're not intrinsic, essential nature as physiognomic characteristics. These are socially constructed uh, images, right? They're socially constructed modes of behavior. All right, another, um, another familiar problem for any machine learning practitioners in the audience is that of imbalanced classes. Um, I bring up this imbalanced brain, so in marketing, um, there's this horrible, everybody loves to use acronyms, and they always are horrible. So marketing, there's this notion of top of the funnel to bottom of the funnel, which basically shows that you know there's a lot of people who engage with some website and a few people who buy things. So when we're, for example, as a data scientist working on a task that says, who should I market stuff to based on who's gonna convert, we end up having a ton of instances of people who didn't 
convert and very few of people who did. So you can imagine it would be a great problem to solve if we had an equal number of you know, those who buy products and those who don't. But it's a very imbalanced class. We've got a ton of information on people who don't buy stuff and very little on people who do. And this shows up across various machine learning contexts. And it can be problematic in instances where we have few examples of minority populations. So um, uh, Moritz Hart, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, I think it's that it's the reverse inverse quadratic. So the error um, on a particular type of classification task scales inversely to the, to the sample size. So um, what this looks like is if we've got, say, a task that says, who should we recommend an ad to for a particular product, um, it's going to do great for a population for which we have tons of data and algorithm that we build, and it's going to do like close to random for populations where we don't have a lot of data, which means we'll end up having disparate treatment for those two subpopulations. Got a couple more examples. They go all over. This is like the tour of machine learning issues and, and bias. Um, this one comes from sentiment analysis. Issue at hand here is we want to define algorithms that identify negative sentiment about our brand. Um, you know, so classification task at hand is, is the text positive or negative? Um, often these algorithms, they perform better with very strong language. So uh, men will come in and say things like, this product fucking sucks, I never want to use it again. And women will say, you know, I'm not really sure if I liked this, I might reconsider it sometime in the future, right? And so the algorithms love the strident expression and have a little bit more time with the nuance. And it just so happens in our in society that men happen to use those strident expressions more frequently, which means in an automated in the context of an automated system, they will get a disproportionate uh, amount of attention from the brand. Um, this stems from a, a, a real technical problem where when we're sort of designing our algorithms, there's a, a set of statistics called precision and recalls. If we've got we, the task here is to go out and find all of those negative expressions, we can try to find as many as possible, or we can try to find really the ones that matter so that we can take action faster, and there's often a trade-off. So in marketing context, we really want to find those ones that the negative stuff that matters, so we can address things quickly as opposed to finding every instance of negative sentiment on the internet, and that implicit trade-off leads to some of these results. I think this is the final example I have of um, areas where things can go wrong. Okay, so. Last one, this one comes from language processing where in the field we've moved from uh, a traditional natural language processing structure that was influenced a lot by Noam Chomsky where we sort of would take language and our means of rendering it, com let's say, cognizable by a computer, um, com com computable, was to um, parse out a sentence into its various parts and then, and then render those entities like into the ones and zeros and digitization bits that we use in, in, uh, in, in computational systems. Um, we'll skip over this in the interest of time, but in the state of the art natural language processing techniques that uh, are out there today, we've shifted from that sort of top down approach to one that's much more bottom up, where we'll accept the messiness of language, take in a sentence, represented as a string of numbers pointed out in space, and then use the geometric relationships between these mathematical representations as proxies for semantic meaning. So this has led to some cool, what they call word algebra, where we can input into the system man and woman, and say as man is to king, so woman is to what? Right, and the, and the system will output queen. And it's doing that, again, by mapping man is to woman, it plots king, and then we query the system and we say which vector is at that, you know, in the same dimension and of the same length as the one between man and woman. So that's sort of the, the algebra that's going on there in geometric space. So um, some research by some folks over at Microsoft uh, and affiliated uh, correla uh, collaborating academics found the following. So they put in man is computer programmer is woman is to what in the system output homemaker black male is to assaulted as white male is to what in title two. Um, <laughs> so uh, the algorithms are not evil. I like to call this one the time warp effect of algorithms. Um, so basically to get those deep learning systems, these complex vector representations of words to perform well, they have to require a lot of data, which means 
going back to our data collection, data generation questions at the beginning of our process. Um, they might go a little bit further back in history so as to find a corpus that's large enough to train the system. And in doing so, we sort of end up falling back into social conventions that we believe we've moved beyond, right? So it wouldn't be kosher and polite for us to make an analogy like black man is to assaulted to as white man is to entitled to. Um, but those things did exist in the past and the systems will pick them up uh, if, we're not, if we're not careful. Um, so moral of the story for this section is it's basically always more than just the model. I find there's a lot of talk in the ethics of AI space that, that is laser focused on how machine learning models work and, and don't work. Um, I think that's great. I think it's great that there's that we're starting to grapple with uh, with these questions from a technical perspective. But as I tried to show, it's it, you know instances of of social contextual bias can uh, creep in in many points in the process. Proxies are powerful but tricky. Uh, I think the biggest thing is articulating what questions they're actually answering versus what we'd like them to answer. And then again, bias can exist in various various areas across the pipeline. Okay, so what can we do and what should we do? Um, we have to talk to one another. Uh, words mean different things to different people. So this is coming from a talk that my friend Kate Crawford gave at NIPS, the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference last December, where she's shown that even the word bias for somebody working in the statistical community refers to, a, it's a technical description on the, dis, on the errors and variance in data sets according to the function that you build. This is you know, cognitive bias, um, confirmation bias, where we come in with our stupid minds and uh, color and interpret different things that occur in the world according to what we like to see. There's bias in judicial process, right? So depending on what community we're in, these words can mean something yeah. different. And it's really important that if we're going to solve these problems from a policy, uh, practical implementation, and an academic perspective, we need to sort of define our terms and make sure we're talking about the same things. It's cool that they have different meanings, but when we're talking to one another, we need to be mindful of the fact that there are indeed differences. So should we regulate fate, fairness, accountability, transparency, and explainability, as well as security and privacy? Um, there's attempts to do that in Europe. Uh, so um, this, there's new legislation, the General Data Protection Regulation, I believe, that came out. It's, it's, it's stated to go live in May, on May 25th. And what's fascinating right now in terms of how this legislation was constructed is the amount of like variance in interpretation across the different domains. So a tweet from Pedro Domingos on January 28th, he basically said, like, thanks European Union, your right to require that algorithms are explainable makes deep learning illegal. And you hear that a lot across the ML community where we are interpreting this right to an explanation as we need to be able to concretely determine and, and basically decompose what input data leads to what output feature. And remember I said earlier on that in a deep learning section it's sort of distributed across the network and we can't do that. So a lot of people made an assumption that like deep learning is fucked for the enterprise. Um, I talked, I gave a talk at Harvard uh, last June and there was a fellow there from PwC Europe who wrote and said I checked with my lawyers <laughs> and they said that basically that's, that's not the case at all. Um, an explanation uh, includes per the legal decision of folks at PwC or the advice that they're about to give to their clients that you need to disclose what personal data are used as input, what outcomes, what are the outcomes of these models and how they can impact, what are the principles of profiling which is in scare quotes so that needs to be defined. So there's a lot of ambiguity in terms of you know the legal advice that that companies are about to receive but the moral of the story is it's not what we in the machine learning community have deemed an explanation at all. So then we say, well, what would a good explanation look like? Um, there was an attempt in New York City to start to render algorithms accountable. My friend Julia Powell's wrote an article uh, in December that showed why you know, they made a bad decision. So they basically said, perfectly transparent would be to reveal the source code to the public. So anytime a decision is made about you, you get access to this. So uh, Julia astutely said, well, that's not necessarily, it might be perfect, but it's not meaningful to anybody. Right, so we're not able to give somebody a good explanation for why this, why you were uh, impacted the way you were. There's a lot of literature out there that I dislike, uh, where um, pundits, uh, BJ works for Andreessen Horowitz, um, say, well, gosh, it's not like humans make meaningful decisions, right? So um, we, 
can be hungry and there's all you know and 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 lead to incriminating somebody versus not incriminating them or there's all sorts of complex things that influence our intuitions when we make a decision what we're great at is retrospective rationalization so once a decision has been made we come back and we can sort of uh, narrate what seems like a plausible causal analysis for why we did what we did um, that's right uh, and there's a place in time for psychology and sort of Reading Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky is always a wonderful experience in terms of sort of unpacking uh, our natural stupidity, but I don't find these arguments are practical and charitable to actually lead to productive discussions on choices that people building systems can make as they think about what fairness means, what accountability means, what transparency means. Um, decrying our own, our own cognitive bias doesn't help us solve that problem. Back to that slide that I put up with the various parts of designing a machine learning process, I feel like at each step there would be questions related to various types of accountability with less emphasis on what exactly is the model that we're using to solve the problem and more emphasis on what are the questions that we're asking in the various areas for social context to occur across the process. So, um, so in going through it, it starts off with a a design question related to what matters for the given situation. So there's not really like a one one size fits all approach to thinking about fairness because the task varies per context, the areas where bias can occur varies per context. So um, there's other sub questions, but two that I listed for this are um, what's you know what problem are we trying to solve. So um, how should we structure our optimization tasks? So example uh, with um, information retrieval. In a legal context where the task is to find all of the relevant information for a case to make a decision as to, you know, as to, to make a decision upon some matter, we'd be interested in finding a lot, as much information as possible, presumably all of it, as opposed to finding, um, as opposed to having a lot of false negatives that we'd have to cull through. Um, adding additional work to our team. It's more important for the justice system that we, you know, we have we have that information versus spending more time working can be different in marketing. And then there's another one that's just sort of like, what is the bad outcome we're really worried about? Um, what's the worst thing that could happen if we deployed the system? Um, and then, as, as I mentioned earlier on, I think mapping the entire process of the data that's collected and how and why all the way through the algorithm. Um, asking these clear questions when you get to the model, what your proxies actually measure so that you can think about when the system is put in use. Um, there's differences, I think, that we would consider if it's just an automated decision or if there's a human that then is processing the output and then additional information that should be communicated to the user. All of these things could be written down, and I think they would be written down sort of during, as, as part of documentation for a system. Um, the critical constraints are sort of policy-oriented constraints, so when we're solving our, our task, um, what are, are there, are there notions of fairness we need to put in there? Are there sort of extra societal issues we want to consider? And then the fault, and then the, the last one is on, uh, given all this information, can we come to a person who's going to make a decision on how the outcomes that we'd like to achieve from the system to make trade-offs? So example, um, with the insurance company that we're working with, we've got a model that's built to predict who they should market to based upon likelihood to convert. We'd like to render it fair probably going to take a little bit of a cut on accuracy. So the company will make less money. Um, is that okay? Do they want to override short-term profitability to achieve you know, greater fairness? Similar trade-offs occur in the realm of privacy with some of the new techniques that are out in machine learning, where um, you know, privacy is different when it goes to a, uh, where the attack can occur across a distribution as opposed to just at a single individual piece of data. And there are some techniques out there to make it very difficult to identify information about an individual from that statistical distribution. But you get a little bit of a cut on your on sort of your performance on the model with the techniques that they exist today. So you have to make a choice, right? It's it's not a there's technical means, but they require sort of a you know a policy oriented decision. And then documentation. So like writing this down so that there could be um, evidence and accountability in the future. Again, is this right? Um, there's a lot missing. There's a lot more that we could be said. This is just sort of a first pass to put it out there for discussion with the community over the next six months or so. We're trying, we have a big push on helping enterprises like deploy 
fair, accountable, transparent, um, explainable in a way that I like, um, you know, private and secure systems. And so trying to sort of work, uh, get this all put together. Okay, so what the researchers in the tactical community are doing to, to solve some of these issues. So this goes back to the, um, as man is to uh, computer programmer, so woman is to homemaker. So the solution they did was as follows. And this is, again, this is on how we're representing the data for the algorithm as opposed to what the algorithm then does. So they plotted the data. They took it from its 50, 55 quadrillion dimension space down to a measly two. And they um, put it on you know, x axis, y axis, went out to Mechanical Turk, and asked people to embed their, you know, their social, it's Mechanical Turk, so this is going to be imbued with what is reasonable standards in current 2016 context. Um, asked them to map the terms based upon whether or not they were socially sensitive and protected or neutral. So, um, so they took the neutral terms and put them below the x-axis. So she associated with um, fiance, wife, sister, lady. Right? These are words that we're comfortable having a gender association with, with, um, you know, with females. And then he could go with chap and lad and boyhood. And then they put all of the socially sensitive attributes above, as determined by the poles on Mechanical Turk. And then what they did was um, they, all of the terms that were below the x-axis were able to retain their affiliations with the gender identity. And all the ones above were collapsed down to the center, so that going forward, the classifier wouldn't associate words like divorced and lust and thighs with women. They would just be in a sort of central <laughs> neutral point. Um, there's a lot of work going on at the University of Toronto in rendering representations fair, uh, slightly different types of techniques where they uh, are taking the data and before using it to solve some machine learning problem, they make sort of an intermediate copy of the data. And as they're making that copy, they have an optimization task itself whose job it is to um, keep as much information as possible about the data set to solve the problem while trying to obfuscate aspects that are socially sensitive attributes. So it's basically a, a very clever way of trying to decouple, let's say, your ethnicity from your zip code, right? Or a social, like your gender from, I don't know, your favorite color, which just so happens to be highly predictive of your, of your banking credit or whatever it may be. Um, so there's, this field is evolving. There's um, a lot of research work on uh, encoding data sets and finding just latent representations that are really great for a task, but, but pulling out information that we don't necessarily want, um, want, want to be impacting our representations. There's a video of Richard Zemmel, who's uh, one of the professors leading this work. He gave a talk here that goes into this, this in much greater detail. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I'd recommend looking at the uh, recorded talks on the site. Um, and then there's some what post hoc analysis. So taking our algorithm, having them give outputs, and then t fiddling around with the representation in the algorithm itself to try to explore what it might be doing. So um, this is an example from a guy, Julius Adebayo, who's currently at Google going to MIT next year, where basically we've got our input data, we put it through a black box, it gives an output. He takes, and you know, when we look at that output, he takes the data, does a particular type of transformation. So he did orthogonal. So say it's here, it goes 90 degrees up, um, puts it through the model, gets a different output, and then basically uses the distance between the output of this model to infer conclusions about which which attributes were sensitive. So if we've got like like ethnicity, let's say it's you know you're black, you're Asian, you're white, he's transforming that to do this and puts it through the model to make this sort of reverse engineered conclusion on the extent to which it's impacting the prediction. Other forms of post hoc analysis exist in the um, black box world to try to make sense of them. Um, so this is, uh, there's a technique called LIME, uh, locally interpretable model agnostic explanation, where um, we can basically probe a neural network to try to see which aspect of our input data it's focusing its attention on. So in these neural, neural networks, there's, um, there's different sort of relationships between what's happening locally and what's happening globally. So here they say, 
let's zone in on a very local part of the model and pretend it's linear in that local area and use uh, perturb the data locally to try to see which aspects of it might be impacting our prediction. So it's again, it's the, the, the model in production is the fancy curving all over the place uninterpretable deep learning model and after the fact we go back and sort of parse it and explore it in local areas to see what might be occurring. So that's just a sample, again, a lot of this was sort of greatest hits, but a sample of some of the, some of the technical work that's going on out there. Um, it's, uh, my take is we have to admit, we have to at least get to the point where our discourse is concrete enough so we can admit that this is just, these are all convex reflections of stuff that's going on in society. But we have the possibility to use our past in a way where we can rewrite our future if we decide to step in and make policy decisions. So that's my abstract call to action. Um, and as you've seen throughout the presentation, there's this is all at an ambiguous state of like early work. So there's there's a lot of exciting stuff we can do together as a community to, to address these issues. I think we have a really good